Good evening, Fernwood. It is your 20th century buddy, Neil, here, and it's time for us to revisit the time of the gas crisis with an episode of Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. Today we are watching episode 138 from October 13th, 1976. It's the middle of the second week of season two. Let's do our recap. Mary has found herself quite befuddled at being in the mental ward. Nurse Gimble does her best to reassure Mary that she's in the right place. Kathy reaches out to Cleet Meisenheimer to see if he will still marry her. He says yes he will until he finds out that Kathy is pregnant and that the baby is probably not his. Over at the Hartmans, Martha overreacts to many of the deadly items in Heather's kitchen while Tom comes over to reassure Martha and Heather that Mary is safe in the ward. Loretta gives a brief call to Merle Jeters to arrange a meeting about some mysterious item that we don't know. And then finally, back at the mental ward, Nurse Gimble takes Mary to finger painting. Mary asks Nurse Gimble about the various injuries that she has collected over the last few weeks. And Nurse Gimble at first blows it off, but then has somewhat of a depressive response. Then Chester Markham comes in and continues his apocalyptic tirade. We'll see what that means. That is all of the recapping for yesterday's episode. Let's do this. Mary Hartman! Mary Hartman! You know, if I'd only been there like five itty bitty seconds earlier, I mean, none of this would have happened. Oh, and then I seen you on TV and you were just holding back your tears and everything, you know, and I wanted to come and comfort you. But the truth of the matter is I need to comfort him myself. I just can't help but think that it should have been me and not Jimmy Joe. No, no, wait a minute, Loretta. Don't, don't ever talk like that. You sure you don't want a Coke or a ginger ale or something like that? Merle, how can you talk about soda pop at a time like this? I'll tell you something, Merle. You hiding and holding back your tears and grief, everything, it's going to hurt you. Merle, it is going to hurt you bad. Loretta, I don't understand what it is you want me to do. You want me to show my grief to everybody? I'm going to walk away from life, start looking for blame, stuff like that? No, I don't, Merle, but I mean, he was your only son that you had. And I don't know about you, but I, I myself personally carried two. I never actually, you know, go, and, well, I don't know, but I felt more grief losing them two poor, innocent little babies than you seem to feel for a whole you know, Loretta, look, let me, let me tell you something. I, I can't tell you how... How sorry I am you lost those two babies. Because in my opinion, if I ever if I ever met anybody that ought to be a mommy, I ought to have kids, it's you. But let me tell you something. Don't ever start telling me how I felt about my boy. You understand that? You think I don't have a sense of loss where that's concerned? You got to remember that for six years I was both mother and father for that little guy. You think I don't miss hearing that voice? Seeing them big eyes look at, look up at me through them little steel glasses? The price is right. What? Last Wednesday, I saw you on TV, right? The price is right, you were there. Oh, no. No, it wasn't me on The Price is Right. No. Are you sure? Yeah. I could have, I could have sworn it was... I'm sorry, excuse me. Sorry to bother you. Okay. Merle, I, I want to apologize for what I said. I, I really feel sorry. I do. I do, because I know, gosh, even the worst person in the world would feel grieved over losing somebody like Jimmy Joe. And I know that, I know what kind of person you are, and basically, you're a good, good guy, and, and a real father, and everything like that. And I'm sorry. I just. Loretta, let me ask you something. Did you. You ever hear the expression, finally got the news? You ever hear that? Yeah, I heard it's like in the gospel or something, right? right? yeah. Well, I want to tell you something. I, I hope like heck you understand. But let me go back in time a bit. Remember I told you how I mourned about Jimmy Joe's mother when she died? Yeah. It was a terrible blow to me. The woman was like, well, she was a saint. And when I didn't have her hand to guide me, I, I thought I was lost. Well, now, 
I've lost Jimmy Joe. The thing is, I thought I was going to stay lost for good. And then I got the news. And I, I don't mean like the 6.30 news like Jimmy Joe died for. I mean the news of life. Life everlasting. It's something... It's something inside of me, as strange as that may sound. It's so deep. It's it's deeper than the than the church feeling or the or the preaching thing or any of that stuff. Loretta, I can honestly say that I can feel the Lord's will. I can feel that He has a reason for everything that He does. Really, you can Absolutely. feel it. Absolutely. Now I used feel to it. know. That's exactly the distinction I'm trying to make right now. I used to know that kind of thing, but now I feel it inside, and it's a whole different thing. It's like I, I have a rejoicing in my heart, aside from the sorrow. And I want to share that with you. I want you to feel that, too. Uh, I'm sorry to bother you again, but I just remembered where I saw you on television. You're the man who lost his son, aren't you? That's right. Yes, sir, I remember you talking about working hard and, and instead of uh, doing wrong and trying to get things back. Well... I'm not a religious person, and I don't like politics, or politicians, which you kind of sound like. Well, I just want you to know I I like a man I can believe in. Well, I'd, I'd like you to take this. That's a $20 bill. Yeah, it sure is, which, which I can't accept, partner. I, I can't do anything like that. I can't accept a true Christian charity that's in your heart and I gotta tell you I appreciate that but well Merle uh, what about for the condos for Christ you can take it for the condos for Christ there you go well if you want to contribute to that all you have to do is send it into the condos for Christ and that's box 666 right here in Fernwood Ohio but I I can't take it personally you understand that's uh, box 666 666 right well I'll tell you it'll be in the mail the first thing in the morning well that's great I appreciate that <laughs> Oh, there's one other thing. If you ever have any intentions of uh, running for a public office, you've got my vote. <laughs> well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. And to you, thanks for coming over. <laughs> That's very nice. Wow, oh, that is beautiful. That is one of the most beautiful things I have ever seen in my very life. Nice. I mean, it is important. It is righteous. Do you know what it is? Really, you can yeah. feel him in it too. You know, he what meant I mean? it. Yeah. I mean, it's really boosted up my faith. And you know why? Because it's just one thing saying it. You know, a lot of people can say it, but you just practiced what you preached, Merle. You know what I wish I could do? Restore everything of the faith that you've lost before I say goodbye. What do you mean, goodbye? Oh, I forgot to tell you. I'm, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm going back to North Texas, back to where my roots are, so to speak. I'm going to just start all over again. When are, you, when are you gonna go? Tomorrow. I'm I'm leaving tomorrow. Ooh, as a matter of fact, I better get back over to the motel and start packing right now. You all set? Yeah. Let me just take care of this. Well, listen. Um. Hey, listen, Merle. I really wish you just the best of everything. You know. Well. And uh, all the good luck that you can find hidden anywhere is in North Texas that it happens to be hitting. And I just. Well, goodbye. I I just don't know whether I should be telling you this, Doctor. What is it? Is something wrong? Well, that's the problem. I mean, I don't really know. I think very wrong. I hope no one on the staff has upset you. Oh, no, the staff is terrifically competent. I mean, they all come to work, um, especially at medication time. I mean, I can't think of better people at giving medication. They always give the right medication to the right patients except for three times that I can think of, and that was just a question of sleeping it off. It's a patient. Good, and we're not responsible. Well, I'm not responsible with the doctor. I swear to you, I'm not responsible. I mean, I'm responsible in the way that a normal person in a mental institution is responsible, but I'm not responsible for Chester. As in Markham? <laughs> now, what can you possibly tell me about Chester Markham that I don't already know? I see him at least twice a week, and I seriously doubt that he withholds anything. I mean, he talks nonstop. 
Then you know about his plan? What plan? To blow up Ohio. He's harmless, Mrs. Hartman, believe me. Well, I must say, it does sound incredible. I mean, the idea of stealing all that nuclear waste just to kill millions of people, you know. Mrs. Hartman, when are we going to start talking about what's really bothering you? We are. We're talking about Chester Markham and my instinct that this man is telling the truth. I respect your instinct about Mr. Markham, uh, but this is a psychiatric institution, and we're here to deal with your instincts about yourself, not your instincts about other people. Now let's approach your problem scientifically. Don't you see what you're doing here? You're, you're transferring all of your hostility that you feel toward your husband for committing you to our care to an innocent target, Chester Markham. But I don't feel it. Any hostility to Tom or Mr. Markham. I mean, I miss him and I love him. I mean, Tom. I mean, I will miss Mr. Markham, but most of all, I trust him. That is Tom. See, at least with Tom, I know when he's telling the truth or not. Then there have been times when your husband has lied to you? Well, nobody tells the whole truth and nothing but the truth all the time to all of the people. I mean, even Abraham Lincoln admitted that, and he had quite a beard. Don't, don't you see, this could be a major source of the resentment you feel toward your husband. I mean, you feel that he should be punished for telling lies, and that's why you want us to punish Chester for his harmless fantasy. Now, you, you, you must look at your motive, Mrs. Hartman, and don't be afraid of what you see. What I see is that you're not listening to me, you're listening of me. I don't want to talk to you anymore, I just want to go home. Nurse Kimball, though. Mrs. Hartman is ready to leave now. Oh, doctor, thank you so much. That was so kind of you. And I know that I will just feel so much better about everything as soon as I get home. And really, I... Oh, thank you so much. And I won't forget anything you've done for me. Nothing at all. Nothing. Everything's going to be just fine. Oh, I know that. I mean, I know that. And you don't even have to see me out. I mean, I know that, too. Oh, well, I'm not coming with you. You're coming with me back to your friends. We have all kinds of group activities planned for this afternoon. But first, you must have a little nap. No, but I, I don't want to go to sleep now. I'm not going to go to sleep now. I'm going home now. You he said the doctor said I'm ready to go home. You said I'm ready to go home now. You just said I'm ready to go home. Is that the same Mary Hartman that you were ready to release a week ago? Well, it is taking a little longer than I had hoped for her to confront her real problems. The longer the better. Did you see the mail that's pouring in for her every day? There's no way to buy the kind of publicity that her breakdown is giving us. Every day that Mary Hartman is here is like money in the bank. We'll get that new wing yet. We might even call it the Mary Hartman Clinic for the commercially insane. Mary, just look at all this mail. And it's all for you. Oh, how nice. Who's it from? Tom and Heather? No, from your fans, the people who saw you on television. Why don't you read some? Maybe it'll take your mind off this morning when I picked you up at Dr. Williams' office. You were so upset. No, nothing's gonna do that. I just want him to tell me that he'd believe me about Chester. I'm not gonna bring it up ever again. Now, Mary, you must stop believing the worst in everyone. Now, try believing the best. You'll be right just as often, and you'll get well a lot sooner. At home, they criticize me for just the opposite. Now, here's Chester. He can help you go through your correspondence. He's very good at correspondence. He writes a dozen letters a day. You're supposed to start with the mailgrams first. I wonder what ever happened to Western Union. Uh, you're right here at the bottom. Yeah. Oh, I see. And I told you that Chester would be very helpful. Now, I'll leave you two alone. Have a nice day. Yeah! Chester! I have a 
is any real problem. I've had it since I was a little girl. I got it swimming in gym. I mean, I really think I have heard that for the last time. Does that mean you're leaving? I mean that we're all gonna leave. Unless our new president gives us a reason to stay. But I'm not sure I can wait until January. Well, I'm not leaving. I'm back. Oh, Wanda. Oh, Wanda. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. You look wonderful. And I'm so glad to see you. And I'm so very glad to be back. Oh, no, but I'm so very glad to see you. I wonder you're the only person here I can talk to. Well, it's not like you've been alone. Look at all this fan mail. Oh, no, but that's just television. I mean, that's just the power of television. That's not for me. It's for oh, that person no. who was on television. No, 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 Mary. It's for you. Well, television tells the truth about people. You really think so? Oh, sure. It told the truth about Nixon when he had those debates with Kennedy, didn't it? And it also told the truth about that man I saw on the news. You know, the one that lost his son? Merle Cheater? Oh, that's him. Keep your eye on him. Believe me, I know charisma, and that man has it. I just hope he knows what to do with it. You have it too, Mary. Here, listen to this. Dear Mary, I very much enjoyed seeing you on the David Susskind Show. I hope you're feeling better because you are a good person and good people deserve love and happiness. Love, Marjorie Stella Mattini. P.S. If you're not too busy, please send me a picture of yourself with an autograph from my wall. I will put you right next to Jane Meadows because she is a good person too. <laughs> Isn't that adorable? <laughs> here's, here's another one, Mary. You read this one. Um, dear Mary Hartman, Thank you for having the courage to admit that your husband has trouble performing on national television. Is there something funny sounding about that sentence? Mrs. Hartman, you have a long-distance telephone call. From who? It's from Rome. It's Gore Vidal. Who? Please, Mrs. Hartman, don't keep him waiting. Who is he? He's very famous. Oh. Well, so what should I say? Well, just be yourself. And don't worry about saying anything. Here, just listen. What's he saying? I think he's listening back. Oh, my God. Hello? Hello, are you still there, Mr. Vidal? Oh, good. Good. Molte buono. I have Mary Hartman right here. Um, Mr. Vidal? Oh, what a surprise! I mean, you know, what a surprise for me! I mean, you probably knew about this because you made the call. Are you in a booth? Uh, I was just going to say that if you were in a booth and if your dime ran out or anything, I could probably call you back. Well, that, that's very generous of you. But listen, how are you feeling? Because I understand you had some, some trouble with David Susskind. Me? Trouble? No. No. He, he was a wonderful person, and I am terrifically normal, uh, just as a result of having met him. How is he? Is he still with us? <laughs> Well, I'm glad to hear you're fine because, well, I want you to help me write a book. Absolutely. About what? Oh, listen, I don't even need to know. Why don't you just throw out a subject and I'll just jump in there. I'm sure between the two of us we can come up with something. I wish I could place his face. Why don't we do it at your place, um, okay? I mean, I'd be willing to start first thing in the morning. Um, how about a recipe book or uh, just sayings? No, no, a book about you, Mary, about your life, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. Look, is this a joke? Who is this? No, Mary, Mr. Vidal is the author of Burr and Myra Breckenridge and, and The Best Man. The Best Man? Uh, would this be about a wedding? No, 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 no. Well, then what do you want? I want to write about you. About me? Oh, um, listen, uh, I'm a nothing. No, no, you are a something. 
Well, all right. I mean, I'm a, you know, a housewife consumer. You were very special, Mary. I mean, the story of Mary Hartman is the story of America, 1976. Do you mean like a sequel to 1984? No, no, more like a sequel to de Tocqueville's Democracy. I want to take up where he left off. America, the perennially empty continent, yet always somehow pregnant, like you, with, with possibility. Fine. Anything just to write. Look, I'm coming to the States, and I want to meet you. I want to work with you. You're going to come to Fernwood? It has always been my dream to see Fernwood, Oklahoma, Ohio. Gore Vidal in Fernwood? I can't imagine that. Who is he? Is there swine flu there? Oh, listen, we can get you anything you want. Well, luckily, I can imagine anything, even you, even me. So I'll be seeing you shortly, Mrs. Hartman. Uh, shortly. Listen, is there any possibility that you'll be here by dinner? What are you having for dinner? Oh, I don't know. Could you hold on a minute? What are we having for dinner? A uh, 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 veal chop and asparagus and mashed potatoes and uh, a lovely jello mold for dessert. I'll be there in a couple of weeks. That's fine. I'll see you then. Bye. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That was Gore the doll. I'm going to be a book. I'm going to be a star. I just wish I could place that face. He sounds so much like Walter Buckley. Mary certainly seems to be getting a lot more popular. And I maybe didn't realize exactly how big her splash was. So we start at the Capri Lounge with Loretta and Merle, and I mean, Merle seemed a little bit human, but I feel like there should be some grief or some elements of mourning. I mean, his child just died days ago. But I guess Merle is gonna reinvent himself, either by moving to Texas or, as is hinted again and again, taking political office. The stranger walking up and thinking that he was a game show guest at first, you know, one of the contestants on a game show. It's a kind of familiar feeling of being recognized for something that you didn't do. And then that same person coming over and saying, hey, I would vote for you. It seems really clear. And also, you know, I'll, uh, I did read the back of the DVD set accidentally to know what's going to happen next. But, well, it seems clear we're going to have a lot more Merle lately. Then it's Mary, and all Mary, I think, for the rest of the episode. Dr. Williams at first seemed so human and willing to give Mary the room to, to heal and grow or, you know, even release her very early on. But he didn't even humor her thoughts about what was going on with Chester Markham. And I don't know what I would do if I were a psychologist or psychiatrist in this case. Uh, I don't think that Mary's fear about Chester has anything to do with Tom. So that is something that, you know, isn't. While Tom is definitely part of Mary's, like, life, and one of the big issues that Mary has is her relationship with Tom, that's not what she's worried about now. So let her talk about what she's worried about now. Let her get that stuff out. Let her get her Chester Markham fears out. And if you're not going to do anything about them, at least Mary's not worried about them, or at least Mary feels heard because Mary doesn't feel heard. She didn't he feel heard by Tom, and she's not feeling heard by Dr. Williams. And Wanda's back, so maybe she will feel heard, but everyone in the ward actually feels like, you know, dismissing 
her concerns about Chester's behavior. And Chester comes back and he immediately blows up and walks out. And then Wanda, you know, is it's nice to see her again. I don't know if she has a story yet, but I figure we will see her soon enough. And then, yes, Mary is a celebrity. She's got tons of mail and a deal to write a book with Gore Vidal, famous author. I have not read any Gore Vidal. I should at some point. I did see the movie for Myra Breckenridge, which was kind of a really gay train wreck. I don't know how to how to talk about that movie. I saw it decades ago, but uh, it's a lot. And I'm curious to see how a modern audience might see that film. I'm kind of curious what people back then thought of that film, but I kind of only vaguely remember what happened in it. I don't know. Maybe I'll put a trailer up there. So that's all I've got to say about this episode of Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman with me. Thanks for sharing your thoughts and feelings about the show down in the comments. Thank you for coming back to the time of the gas crisis and also Jimmy Carter's post-election, pre-inauguration time, we will see you tomorrow night in Fernwood.